As we have passed through Passion Tide and into Holy Week, the shadow of the cross lengthens across the church's liturgies and our collective imagination. The Gospel for the fifth Sunday of Lent this year offered another lesson about mercy and forgiveness, about judgment and condemnation, following on from the previous Sunday's Gospel reading of the parable of the prodigal son from the Gospel of Luke, <coughs> which, much like any of Jesus' parables, raises more questions than it appears to answer. The celebrations of Palm Sunday marked our entry into the most solemn week of the Christian year, but by way of another, as it were, supplementary introduction to the week, I would like for a few moments to stay with that gospel story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery, for reasons which I hope will become apparent. It's one of the most well-loved passages in the New Testament. It includes the familiar quotation, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. It seems that to begin with, it may have, this story may have enjoyed a life of its own within the tradition before finding a final resting place in the opening verses of John chapter 8. And it's missing from some early, uh, early uh, ancient manuscripts, according that is to some early witnesses. Jerome, uh, St. Jerome among them, he who translated the Greek Bible into Latin, into the Vulgate as it was called, and his near contemporary St. Augustine. Problem is, we don't have the very earliest transcripts of the Gospels, and we don't know how long it took for the materials we have in the Gospels to settle down into their present form, except that it, we think it must have happened relatively quickly. So that with the earliest manuscripts that we do have, dating, I think the earliest from the third, uh, late third century or so, um, the variations between the, well, the manuscripts we do have are very few, but this, passage is one of them it's not in all of them not even the ones we still we do have now what really matters is that the collective wisdom of the very early church judged this story authentic and that it go, go, went all the way back to the author of the fourth gospel the gospel of john gives great prominence to jesus presence in jerusalem and his preaching in the temple alongside his ministry in Galilee. John describes four separate visits to, of, of Jesus to Jerusalem and the temple during his ministry and a cleansing by Jesus of the temple precincts in John chapter 2 during the first of these four visits. This means that in John the conflict in Jerusalem between Jesus and the religious authorities there begins much earlier than in the other three gospels where Jesus that's the direct conflict, I mean, the direct confrontation, uh, where in the other three Gospels, the, the cleansing of the temple occurs after his final triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, at the beginning of our Holy Week. But though the other Gospels mention only a single visit, even so, we can detect hints of other visits. Mark's Gospel in particular interlocks with the Gospel of John at various points. Mark recalls early opposition to Jesus' ministry in Galilee from the religious leaders in Jerusalem and their hostility towards him as soon as he arrives in the holy city. Mark, 14, uh, Mark chapter 14 verses 12 to 16, uh, a passage followed by Matthew and Luke, tells us of contacts in Jerusalem with whom Jesus could make secret arrangements to keep the Passover in the holy city. In Mark 14:45. Peter gains entrance to the high priest's courtyard, although it's John, John's gospel alone that tells, which tells us that it was another disciple who was with Peter, who was well known there, someone who had access to the high priest's residence, who got him in to the, uh, to, to the trial hearing before the high priests. Mark 14, 49 also records that as Jesus is arrested in Gethsemane, he will exclaim that day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. In verses 58 to 59, at his trial, Jesus is charged with threatening to destroy the temple. In John 2, uh, in John chapter 2, during Jesus' first Jerusalem visit, after he had cleansed the temple, uh, th then uh, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, which John tells us, of course, is a reference to the temple of his body. Then, after that visit, 
that uh, that first visit, Jesus returns to Galilee for a time before his second visit, according to St. John's Gospel, St. John's Gospel, when he heals a man on the Sabbath. And from that point on, in John's Gospel, his enemies are making plans for his arrest and seeking his, de his death. The other Gospels concentrate on a single visit and place the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of our Holy Week. So was there more than one incident like this? Both St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, think that indeed there was, and why not? Most important in all this is that these visits to the temple in John's Gospel give us some of the most revealing teachings of Jesus about his mission, and in particular, his relationship with his heavenly father. It's as if the temple and its precincts were the appropriate place for, it, for this intimate relationship with his heavenly father to be unfolded in greater depths. And notable among these is his temple speech in John chapter five, which begins with a prov provocative statement as follows. Jesus said to the Jews, that's, that's to say the Jerusalem leadership, hoi yudaioi, is John's uh, term for these leaders. My father goes on working and so do I. But John remarks, that was why the Jews, the Jewish leadership, sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the sabbath but also called god his father making himself equal with god and this became part of the pretext for his arrest and trial along with this saying about destroy the, destroying the temple for example the gospel for the fifth sunday in lent begins by reporting that jesus is again teaching the crowds in the vicinity of the temple quite possibly in the court of the gentiles that part of the temple that is that he had previously cleansed which allowed a limited it was a court that allowed a limited access for non-jews to the sacred ground the scribes and the pharisees approached jesus bringing a woman who has been caught caught in the act of adultery they address him perhaps sarcastically as teacher didaskele perhaps try to trying to lull him into a false sense of security maybe I don't know, asking him whether it would be right to stone her the Pharisees uh, know that according to the law of Moses, indeed Jesus knows this too, those caught in the act of adultery were to be stoned to death. And in the book of Levit Leviticus, we read, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. But as Father Michael pointed out on the fifth Sunday in Lent, only the woman had been singled out for punishment. If Jesus absolves the woman caught in flagrant adultery, it will be said that he has flouted the law of Moses. If he absolves her, if he condemns her, this will be inconsistent with his message of mercy towards sinners. But it is also contrary to Roman law to have a stone. Under Roman occupation, the Jewish people did not have any authority to execute people. And in fact, this is cited in John's story of the Passion. The idea behind their trick question is the same as with their question, the question about paying taxes to Caesar, which we find in Mark chapter 12. Either answer, yes or no, will in either case support the Pharisees' case against Jesus. And this time, Jesus avoids the trap uh, in the similar way by proposing an answer they do not expect. He shows mercy whilst also obeying the law. Correct legal, legal procedure required that both parties to adultery must be charged and there had to be witnesses. A priest would have written the names of those accused in the sand on the temple floor at such a hearing or using some other temporary method. So perhaps Jesus was writing the name of the accused women, woman in the sand. After this, he speaks to those who stand before him and suggests that the one without sin cast the first stone and returns to his writing or doodling or whatever it was. This, by the way, is the only evidence we have of Jesus writing anything though with no detail on what he wrote. In his commentary on St. John's Gospel, St. Augustine suggests that the gesture, this gesture of writing portrays Christ as the divine lawgiver. On the mountain of the law, Horeb or Sinai, on the mountain of the law, God writes the law with his finger on tablets of stone. The Pharisees and the elders disperse one by one, beginning, John intriguingly says, beginning with the eldest. Hmm. Jesus has stepped round the trap they have prepared. We might also give credit to the elders and Pharisees who do not in the end claim to be sinless and worthy of passing judgment. 
These Pharisees are not as self-righteous as the portrait found in the parable of the self-righteous Pharisee and the tax collector. Look it up in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 onwards. Left alone with the woman, Jesus asks her with a hint of irony, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. Jesus' response to those who accuse the woman is more than a caution to us about passing judgment on others. It is a profound lesson in divine mercy and forgiveness, but it is more than that. It contains perhaps the hardest and most direct challenge to us anywhere in the Gospels. It is said that hard cases make bad law, but today we find we must ask ourselves the almost unbearable question about how to apply this Gospel story of condemnation and absolution in the face of the appalling atrocities being meted out to the people of Ukraine. We say that God hates the sinner, uh, God hates the sin without while forgiving the sinner. But we also say, rightly, that it's not for us to forgive the Russian military or their leadership on behalf of anyone else other than ourselves. It never is, least of all, on behalf of the people of Ukraine. So what is our attitude towards the perpetrators meant to be? Does it make any difference that Russian men are routinely brutalized by military life? Does it make any difference that in a dictatorship, everyone is routinely terrorized, terrorized and at the same time gulled by the system they are compelled to serve? Does it make any difference, for example, that Putin's tame media tried to condition Russians to regard the Ukrainian resistance as one, resistance as one led by Nazis? I think the truth is that atroc atrocities, atrocities such as we know are taking place now in Ukraine present us with a very uncomfortable, I say again, unbear almost unbearable face of human nature, that the factors uh, within ourselves as much as out there, that the factors I've just mentioned above about what the Russians are doing make it supremely difficult for any human being, if we were in, their, in those circumstances, to retain their humanity. Nevertheless, there are those who have made a study of such matters, including the Shoah or Holocaust, so-called Holocaust studies, and these have found it possible to define three groups, I didn't write three groups, amongst those who have been involved. First, the perpetrators, those actively involved in any way, including those whom we would class perhaps as collaborators. Second, the bystanders, those who know or suspect what is going on and who more often than not deny it to themselves as well as to others. And third, the resistors or rescuers, those who make some effort to assist those being singled out for extermination. And we know that during the show, there were many such people risking their very lives in doing so. In these final somber days of Holy Week, perhaps especially when we recall Peter's denial of his master, for example, we might even find it in ourselves to wonder to which of these three groups might I belong, were I there, and to say, there but for the grace of God go I. It's not a saying in scripture, but it contains a grain of unpalatable truth, but perhaps even so worthy of contemplation as we approach the sorrow and the pity, the cruelty, and the final triumph of the cross and the new dawn that is Easter.